Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we're uh, still having quite a few attendees filtering in, but we'll go ahead and kind of get the session started. Um, really excited to, to have uh, such a great group uh, with us today, uh, both of the panelists and those of you attending uh, for this session on equitable and culturally informed calls for art, where we'll discuss a couple of uh, really uh, unique and interesting case studies from around South Dakota uh, and talk through some ideas on how to uh, uh, better um, better format and process our calls for art. So first and foremost, I need to thank our sponsors today. Uh, none of this would be possible without the South Dakota Arts Council, the Bush Foundation, or the National Endowment from the Arts. Uh, so we'd want to say thank you so much to their generous uh, grant support, which makes these webinars possible. Today, as we go through the question process, we'd love if you could use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, that will help us to keep the questions in order, and then we'll have some time for Q&A um, um, at the end after both presenters have uh, finished their segments. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for a good Q&A process. Please then, you can use the chat function to talk to each other, uh, to send messages um, with any technical questions or anything like that. But for the questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A and then we will ask those of the panelists later on in the session. So again, thank you so much for being here. I think this is a, a really um, uh, interesting and important topic for our state. I think that um, trying to make sure that we're being very proactive and cognizant about all of the, the activities that we do. I think oftentimes these are the kind of processes that are really easy to just do the way we've done them for many years and not really think about why we're uh, doing the things that we are. Um, so right before we turn it over to our first panelist, I would uh, like to introduce our executive director of Art South Dakota, Mr. Jim Spears. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, yeah, to Andrew's point, you know, there's been uh, a lot of dialogue around equity in the arts community, and we believe that conversation is important, but I, I think through this work, we're trying to say action is what is required. Um, <clears throat> we need to put real focus on change in, in that, that idea of, of, of walking the talk. Um, so I'm really excited about today's program. This is one of the things Art South Dakota has been trying to do is, is to share case studies of work related to equity that has meaning and relevance to our sector, specifically here in, in South Dakota. So I'm thankful to uh, welcome Kellen Boyce, who's the executive director of the Sioux Falls Arts Council. I've had the uh, privilege of working with Kellen for many years and uh, even before we were both doing these jobs that we're in today. And it's it's great that you are leading the Sioux Falls Arts Council and uh, all the great work you're doing uh, with that organization. And then uh, of course, Dr. Craig Howe, and uh, he is the director of Carnes um, and a good friend, a dear friend, a board member of Art South Dakota, one of our leaders. We've learned so much um, from Craig and we're thankful that uh, he uh, contrib contributes so much of his time to the work we're doing at Art South Dakota. So. Thank you both for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Craig Howe now. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Andrew, and uh, thanks for being here uh, uh, with us, Kellen. And uh, this morning, then, I'd like to uh, uh, talk about this issue of uh, equity in the arts here uh, through, and I'll use some slides I have here. So I'm going to uh tried to share my screen here and uh, andrew if you can let me know if you get it that'd be great okay excellent um, okay so what i'd like to do is go through uh, i was asked to talk about uh, some exhibits at Cairns, our organization, the Center for American Indian Research and Native Studies has developed over the past six years. I think our first one was in 2015. And uh, uh, so as in this painting here, it's, we would try to give you a peek behind the curtain of how, uh, of how these exhibits uh, were developed and uh, uh, everything uh, we, we did. And I think in a lot of ways are doing is to uh, <clears throat> recognize that the status quo isn't acceptable. Uh, the status quo has led to the situation, the conditions in our state now. And so uh, 
if you're going to challenge the status quo, every aspect of it has to be under critical uh, investigation. <laughs> so in this, this is just a partial list of, of what we were rethinking for the first exhibit. So the concept is going to be a traditional Lakota narrative. Typically, the concept of an exhibit is the curator's uh, idea, and the curator is almost exclusively a non-Indian. So uh, right away, if we're going to do an American Indian exhibit, uh, we're going to try to decenter these curators, even when those curators are um, American Indians or Lakotas. In this case, uh, it, for this first exhibit, it was myself and uh, Kayla uh, Abed now. Uh, she was at the uh, Sioux Indian Museum in Rapid City at that time. So we were the curators. Both of us are Lakota citizens. The artists were all going to be Lakota citizens. Uh, young and old, uh, half women, half men, um, some in reservations, some in New York City, for instance, and we were going to pay every one of them an honorarium to participate. Um, uh, the artwork, we we're looking for real stylistically diverse artworks, uh, so that there's no way to say this is the way Lakotas paint, right, uh, or create art. This idea that Lakota is not a genre of art, it's a nation that produces artists, and those artists can, can create art in any genre. Uh, the funders, we had a lot of diverse ideas, and we had real inequitable results in the sense that we basically had very little funding. Uh, I think we went quite a bit in the hole over the, uh, over the process, but uh, we have to do it. If we're going to make change, we can't... Uh, uh, somehow stop those efforts through the lack of funding. <clears throat> the audience, primarily American Indians. We just wanted to shift this focus the way art exhibits now are. They're focused for uh, uh, museum audiences and those audiences we know are predominantly non-Indian. So what we wanted to do is a museum exhibit and target somehow uh, American Indians, not to exclude anyone, but to target, to make the audiences more inclusive and more uh, equitable of, of the uh, broader society here in Rapid City. Uh, the opening, for instance, was for <laughs> high school or great or middle school kids, not for you know the the movers and shakers in Rapid City. It was intended for uh, these high school kids. It was a rapper, a Lakota rapper, in the evening, um, and, instead of something kind of wine and dine or something in the afternoon or early evening. Uh, the duration of the exhibit was four days versus months, and so that was crazy. I don't know where we got that idea, but that's what we did. And over those four days, though, we had over 1,100 people visit the exhibit in four days. So uh, we had a real good turnout. <clears throat> and then the events associated with that exhibit, there was this concert I just mentioned by Frank Juan, uh, a Rosebud Sioux Tribe citizen. We had a fundraiser. <laughs> where we didn't raise any funds, but I think we spent everything we, we were raised. But this was by uh, Sue, uh, the Sioux chef, right? Uh, Sean Sherman is his name from uh, Minneapolis. He's originally, he's an Ogallaw Sioux tribe citizen, lives in Minneapolis, has his own um, a business there. He did a, an amazing, uh, uh, not a dinner, but uh, more like appetizers in a diverse uh, food stuffs from this region. We had a panel discussion. There also was a student art show where uh, for Rapid City uh, art students, uh, high school students, and they produced similar artwork, or I don't know how to say, they had the same challenge that the artists in the exhibit had. And that show was at Rapid City High School. And then also we did these, uh, we were real um, proactive about scheduling uh, school tours uh, through the exhibit. So these are some of the things that we're just trying to think out every aspect that the status quo had produced the situation where very few American Indian exhibits were uh, being displayed. A uh, very few American Indians were involved in these exhibits. The first one, again, the title of it is Lakota Emergence. And uh, it was based on a traditional Lakota uh, narrative of how Lakota narrative of how an their ancestors came onto this earth. We divided that narrative into uh, 16 passages, we call them. And here on the screen, you can see passages 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. And you can see that they're different uh, links. Like uh, passage 11 is you know, quite a few sentences, whereas passage 16 is one sentence. And so 
uh, the assistant curator and myself, we divided that narrative into some ways that we thought would that had some type of continuity to the, each of these passages. Take for instance, Ake Dopa, that's 14 in Lakota. In the morning, the people did not know where to go. They were hungry and thirsty. Then the old man and the old woman appeared and they gave them food and drink. So that's the passage. And then what we did was um, we invited, uh, well, first we took that passage and then we went through the, uh, uh, the Sioux Indian Museum's collections looking for artworks created by Lakota ancestors that we thought somehow tied to that passage. So again, the passage is guiding everything. So it talks about an old man and an old woman. So these are these two dolls that were amazing dolls that were created there in the Sioux Indian Museum collection. So we selected those to be paired with this passage. Then after we had the passage and these uh, museum artifacts, uh, then we invited an artist to uh, uh, create an artwork. And in this case, it was Richard Redow and uh, we challenged him with the passage and said, please paint to the passage. And then if you can incorporate these uh, artworks from the uh, Sioux Indian Museum collection. He created this amazing uh, piece here. And you can see the old man uh, on the left uh, giving the people water. And you can see the old woman on the right uh, giving the people uh, food, wasna. And, uh, and so that's what we call this vignette then. We have a passage, we have these uh, artworks by uh, uh, Lakotas in the past, and then we have contemporary artwork by Lakota today. Uh, and the idea is that as this exhibit goes to other museums, those other museums can display their own um, uh, artworks from their collections tied to each of these uh, passages. So it's the art, those uh, Sioux Indian Museum that the dolls, those don't travel with the exhibit. You can, these venues can incorporate their own uh, collections into these exhibits. All right, so that exhibit has been to eight uh, venues. The, you can see them listed there, uh, museums uh, from uh, Seattle to, I don't know, to, I guess to the Brenton Museum in, uh, in Bighorn, uh, Wyoming. And also we develop what we call these community-based uh, versions of these exhibits. And these are uh, reproductions on uh, PVC panels. And you can see then these, it can be in any venue. Uh, and this is a, an example of, of the Lakota Emergence exhibit in the Avera Health uh, Prairie Center there in Sioux Falls. So we can reach these new audiences that wouldn't go to museums or can't go to museums. and and the, it's not the original artworks, but they're really high quality reproductions of these artworks. So what we're trying to do is broaden those audiences, uh, make access to the arts more equitable. We also have website, these, all these exhibits are also on our website. So that's a further way to outreach and, and share these exhibits with broader audiences. The second exhibit was The Great Race, uh, based on a narrative by James LaPointe in his book, Legends of the Lakota. Again, we divided it into passages, this time eight passages, but what we did differently here, and I'm just giving you some examples of what we tried and have tried. Uh, some work, some don't. In this case, for each of these passages, we have four types of, of creatives. We have a 3D artist, a musician, a painter, and a, a poet. And so uh, these, uh, that's 32 artists then that are, are creatives that are involved in the exhibit. And then we wanted to reconceptualize this idea of a, of a reception that most exhibits, you have an opening reception and that's it. A lot of people come, it's a big deal and then it's over. Uh, so what we did was took for each of these vignettes, uh, we had a reception for each of them and over the duration that the exhibit was up. So you can see March 4th, March 11th, March 25th, April 1st, April 8th. And then for each of these uh, receptions, we invited a local nonprofit in Rapid City or Pine Ridge Reservation to host these uh, receptions. So you can see the names then of these reception hosts. And this was a way to generate different or additional constituencies to come to these exhibits because of course each of these companies or organizations would bring their own networks in and it helped them be invested in that exhibit. 
um, they did uh, uh, donate a little bit of cash, but they, uh, in kind, they had to uh, host this reception. And so the, all the receptions were different. We had catered food and homemade food, and it was just a really neat experience to go to the receptions because you never knew what you were going to uh, get to eat and drink that day. Uh, the one thing, all these exhibits, we never prohibited it, but none of the exhibits had alcohol at the receptions. Uh, the exhibit, this narrative is about the, uh, these amazing animals before human uh, that were here on this earth long, long, long time ago. So I think this is the only exhibit ever where American Indian exhibit where the, the, the artist painted dinosaurs. So here we have <clears throat> on the right of your screen is a painting by Dell Ironcloud of, it's called arriving, arriving for the race, you know, and it's, uh, it's all these animals kind of, it looks like this T-Rex in the front's like trash talking to that mastodon behind it, you know, cause it's gonna be this big race and the winner was gonna be a winner take all race. Uh, and then this was the first exhibit where we incorporated uh, artists, uh, sorry, poets. So this idea of broadening these exhibits to be more multi-art uh, uh, or uh, different types of art, uh, disciplines of art. So this is Virginia Driving Hawk Sneedy, and this is her reading her poem. Flat, infinite land where monstrous creatures preyed upon each other until suddenly gone. Limitless prairie home to two-legged and four who sensed unspoken thoughts, feelings of unseen spirit and each other until words came. I like right at the end where she smiles. But So again, uh, some way to uh, incorporate these different art, uh, in this case, poetry and music into these exhibits. And here I'm just going to show a real quick uh, 360 video. This is of the, of the exhibit in um, uh, Journey Museum in Rapid City. And these are teachers there for a workshop studying the artworks and the poems and the songs to, to bring their students here. And I just want to point out that the poems are exhibited in the uh, gallery. And so in front of this uh, woman in, on the right side of your screen, you can see that's the poem on panels right there on the wall. In the foreground, you can barely see it, but the songs are displayed on music stands, <clears throat> excuse me, on music stands in the foreground. So you'll be able to catch glimpses of them as, as we pan around here. <clears throat> And in the background, you can hear the songs. There's these uh, seven songs that are uh, play, eight songs that are playing in the background. And you can see the diversity of the artworks as we go around. There are some more dinosaurs by uh, Roger Brower. Uh, they're, they're the race committee deciding the rules of the race. And there's a poem, those two panels are the poems there in the front. And this is a piece by uh, Dwayne Wilcox on a buffalo hide. Uh, Richard Red Owl's piece there on that short wall. Keith Braveheart's piece with the uh, uh, dinosaurs in it. Iris Soli's piece on the pedestal and uh, Angela Babby's piece on that. So we can see uh, this idea that the artworks and the um, poems are on display in these exhibits and that the, the sound, there's music, uh, uh, Lakota songs composed for the exhibit are being played uh, as ambient sound in the exhibit. Uh, and I just want to, in the gift shop, oh, come on. I'm sorry. Uh, in the gift shop, I wanted to show this, uh, the, the staff on their own in the gift shop arranged their uh, uh, stuffed animals into a race, just like in the exhibit that so all these animals run this race. Well, in their gift shop, they put their stuffed animals as though they were running a race as well. There's also student works that 
the teachers who came and looked at the exhibit, then they organized um, uh, classroom activities and the students created works. And so these were, are on the website as well. So again, we're trying to reach these different audiences, be more inclusive in who's part of these uh, exhibits. The third exhibit was uh, Tapun Shanwi. It's about uh, uh, the story of a Lakota woman who marries a star and she falls to earth and uh, uh, her son is born. His name is Wichach uh, Behinkhbaya. Uh, and then he becomes kind of like the superhero, I think, uh, in Lakota world. So again, the uh, one narrative divided into seven passages with these uh, re uh, um, reception hosts doing this. You can see this is the art artists, where all they're from in the United States. And um, the innovation that we brought to this exhibit, I guess, would be this, this use of QR code so that you can scan these and listen to audio uh, in, the, in the exhibits. In all of our exhibits, we always uh, show this land uh, that where these exhibits are, are within treaty lands and the homelands of Ocheti, Shakuin, or Lakota peoples. And that land has been, um, the land base has been diminished uh, almost always unilaterally by by uh, the United States. The fourth exhibit was called Dockaway about the Wounded Knee uh, Massacre in 1890. You can see the artists are from the United States and Canada in this case. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of artists, creatives, you know, po again, poets, musicians, and um, uh, uh, visual artists. And one thing we started to do is I mean, I am not a musician, uh, Jim and Andrew are musicians, and, but there's some way, how can we exhibit a song? And so one way is through these, uh, these forms, uh, I can't think of the title of what we call these, but uh, from these diagrams, you can see the amplitude of the songs, that's vertical, and then you can see the duration of the songs, which is horizontal, and, and you can study these. For instance, that second song down, you can see it's basically eight parts, but they're uh, four groups of two parts. That's the that's a traditional structure for a Lakota song, and we can see it's called Honor Song for Sitting Bull. And this was a song that was composed for Sitting Bull when he was still alive, before he was assassinated. And uh, that song has been passed down, and Cedric Goodhouse uh, had been taught that, and then he recorded it for this exhibit. This was the opening for that exhibit at the Heritage Center in. Um, uh, at a Red Cloud Indian School. And this is one of the artworks in the foreground. Again, this idea of representing the time, the, the land and these uh, tribal nations today. So it's not just about the past, it's also about contemporary tribes and, and reservations. Uh, one of the innovations we did for this exhibit was to uh, uh, have these opportunities for, for lay people to be involved. And they, if they wanted to create one of these five by five squares, they would contact us. We would mail them that square. And if they could do an artwork on it, or artwork widely, uh, or widely described, and as long as it wasn't offensive, we were gonna, we never turned any away, let me put it that way. We did have a review though, so make sure we didn't have anything offensive. But, they turn in their artwork, we would pay them $12.29. I mean, I thought that was so clever that 1229, December 29th was the massacre. But this way, we can, again, we want to compensate these people for their work. And it's a token, but it lets them know we, we, we value their efforts. So they receive a $12.29. They can sell the artwork. If it sells, they, they, it's their sale. And uh, we also give them a catalog to the exhibit. The intention was we'd get around 300 of these squares to somehow commemorate those 300 individuals who were massacred that day uh, in December in 1890. Um, and we ended up with a lot of, uh, uh, of these squares. And we also did a curriculum tie, well, our curriculum committee did curriculum tied to the exhibit. So again, we're trying to make these educational and more, uh, applicable or in in classrooms across our state. And then the last the exhibit I want to show then and get done here is uh, Articles of a Treaty. And this exhibit 
uh, it's online. You can look at it. It just closed. It was at the Doll Art Center. And next year, it'll be at the Brenton Museum at the Bighorn. Uh, there's an online version. And there you can uh, read the poems and listen to the songs online. And also what I like, we just developed this uh, graphic is this idea of representing the creative. So there's 77 creatives involved in this exhibit. And as I mentioned, these all get uh, honorariums to be involved, but we have 77 um, creatives involved, 75 of them are American Indians, two of them are citizens of the United States and, and not citizens of any uh, tribal uh, government, uh, tribal nation. And of those 75 who are American Indians, 71 of them are Ocheti Shakoween uh, citizens. So this is a way to start to represent that uh, American Indians are citizens of nations. They're not members of minority groups. This is what we're trying to keep pushing and pushing is that this is what differentiates American Indians from um, all other cultural ethnic uh, minority groups. So just in conclusion then I guess, these are kind of how that, uh, what works out over these exhibits, what we've been working on. And then as far as doing this idea of best practices, these would be uh, my recommendations, do your due diligence. Uh, you know, a lot of times I think people have said, this is the way we've done it. That's not acceptable anymore. That, that's not an excuse. That's, that's an excuse to perpetuate the systemic racism we have. Past practices and outcomes, do your due diligence. What, what have people tried and what has been the results of these? Uh, so it, it, it takes work. If we're gonna push back against this, the systemic discrimination, this inequity, it's going to take work and uh, uh, think about terminology. Every aspect of terminology, our words are meaningful. What they they they're a reflection of what we're thinking or not thinking. Uh, cultivate relationships. This is just uh, um, again takes time. You have to inform yourself uh, proactively. You can't wait to meet someone and then start to try to learn. You know you have to do this proactively on your own before you reach out to people then reach out to these artists uh, uh, directly and get out of your chair in your office and go to their place, you know, their studios, if you can. We did that with almost every artist in Lakota Emergence Exhibit. Um, um, and then it's, you know, one thing is to reach out to all these artists uh, when you need them and then forget about them. So what you, what you want to do, I think, is you, you want to keep in touch. It doesn't have to be at a real personal level, but you, you I think it's good to keep in touch with these people and then uh, promote them, uh, promote them as far as uh, uh, in media, but also promote them to positions on boards, on committees, in decision-making roles, uh, work against this uh, systemic discrimination against American Indians in our state. Uh, it's just gonna take all of us working really hard and, and to do that, <laughs> that status quo has to go. This idea that we can develop exhibits without Ameri about American Indians, without American Indians in decision-making and leadership roles is just, that has to stop. And if we're gonna have artworks that are about American Indians, at least for a while here, let's uh, have American Indians representing themselves. But this status quo where non-Indians get all these opportunities, they can, create the artworks and then uh, these museums can say, look, we're diverse, we have an Indian exhibit up, but it's <laughs> the artworks are by non-Indians or the, the leadership is all non-Indians. So these are these efforts that it's, gonna, it's hard and it's gonna upset uh, people that have had power and privilege for a long time. And so it's not easy, I guess, is what I would say. And so that's what I have, sorry about going so long there, Andrew. No, perfect. Thank you so much, uh, um, Dr. Howe. That's uh, um, really exciting. One thing I will say um, before we move on to Kellen, feel free to type, start typing some questions. We'll come back and do a Q&A with both uh, Kellen and uh, Craig at the end of, of the session. Um, but also, I'll make sure to email out. We had a really great conversation um, with Craig about the Dockaway exhibit and uh, Dalton Coffee, who is a filmmaker that did a piece uh, for Art South Dakota on the uh, Karens and the Dockaway exhibit. 
exhibit. And so I'll make sure to send that in the follow up email so you can dig a little bit deeper into that one specific exhibit that uh, um, that Craig was mentioning. So thank you so much, Craig. And we'll uh, we'll turn it over to Kellen now and then uh, come back for a little bit of a Q&A after Kellen's presentation. Hello, uh, I'm Kellen Boyce from the Sioux Falls Arts Council. Thank you, Craig. I, I enjoyed your presentation very much. Um, I almost wish I, we, we would have heard that uh, before we started our call for art, uh, but I think that's what this is all about is learning from each other and trying to maybe not hold on to those old preconce preconceptions that we have about how to do these things. So I appreciate you, you mentioning all those things because again, I think this is a great time to learn. Um, so we were uh, part of, well, we still are, it's still happening. Um, I'm gonna put my slideshow up here. I just click this right, Andrew, and it should, it should begin. You see that there? Not yet. Okay, well, how, how about, well, See, I thought it was working before present, present online. Nope, I don't know. Did you uh, do the share screen from within Zoom? Oh, I did not. So that would probably be why. Thank you. Again, we're all learning. So make sure to click uh, share screen, everybody, if you're doing this at home. Uh, here we go. Okay, great. Now you can see it. I can see you can see it. Wonderful. Um, so yes, we are part of a call for art with a Downtown Sioux Falls and the city of Sioux Falls had received a, some funding from Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, for uh, this art box project. And this was something that we kind of came in uh, at, at the very end of it, as far as to do the call for art, we weren't a part of the grant writing process or you know coming up with the ideas of this. Um, so when we kind of received it, we looked at it like, well, what do they wanna do? And they really wanted to kind of show all the voices and all the artists that exist in Sioux Falls. So we were kind of, prioritizing how we were going to do that, and which groups we were going to reach out to. Um, and, and did kind of what we traditionally do is go to the drawing board and start writing up this call for art, um, which looks something like this. And I think if you're coming from a college or something, you might be used to seeing this. Uh, and, and again, the, the, the real point of this project was to get as many artists and, and people within the community of Sioux Falls and, and beyond in South Dakota to want to do this call for art. And taking this traditional approach, um, I think when we look at these things, we really look at, you know, what's going to create maybe the less, least work for us on our end, on the administrator end. Um, you can see on the other side, we have requirements and all these things, uh, everything that we wanted, all this information that we wanted from the artists prior. Uh, and when we were talking about it, it was like, well, it's going to be, might, might be difficult to get this information from them later. So let's try to get everything up front. Um, so this call for art went out, there were 25 utility boxes that would be wrapped uh, when the artist submitted their work. Uh, they had the potential to get up to $800 at that time. Uh, we would then take their work and wrap it on a vinyl graphic, which would go around a utility box. Um, and I have an example of what it would look like later in the slideshow. But you can kind of see this one out to the community and we did our regular email blasts and emailing our artist directory list and Facebook posts and going on Kelloland Living uh, to promote this. And kind of the bottom line of this idea was we really wanted to, again, represent this whole community. Um, and as we started getting some feedback over time, we really realized there was a lack of kind of what Craig was talking about in the beginning is, is reaching out to those communities and talking to the people that we want to represent in this uh, project. Um, but it hadn't happened. So I had one, one, one of the comments was, you know, who from this community have you actually reached out to and talked to prior to this call for art? And I didn't have an answer for that. Um, I, not being on the front end of this project, um, I, was, I had no idea. So I reached back out to the city in downtown Sioux Falls and, and there really hadn't been a lot of communication with this broader audience that they really wanted to include in this. So it struck me as maybe we were much further down the line than we should be with this project and we need to go back and do some more work. So, uh, which is hard. I mean, we were on a roll. We had a really tight deadline to try to get this out. And I remember just thinking, we're never gonna get everybody, you know, invited to this and, and, and do what we need to do to do it properly with this short timeline. 
and uh, I, I met up with the city of Sioux Falls, their director, and he, you know, we kind of realized the deadline was a non thing. It was a non issue. Uh, the Bloomberg Foundation was willing because of COVID was willing to work with us over a longer span of time for this call for art and the funding. There was no like uh, time limit per se, other than the, the feedback that I got was it was because of the weather they wanted to get these out on the street. Um, and I mean, I guess that's a good, a good reason, but it, it really wasn't for what we were trying to do. I mean, I think in my mind, I didn't realize I could ask that question. Like, why are we taking, why are, why is this being rushed? Um, but I did, I give a little pushback on that as well as asking them, you know, who they had reached out to and, and really finding out that we hadn't done a lot of research on our end on, they hadn't done a lot of research on their end and that we needed to just kind of pump the brakes. So we actually put a halt to this call for art um, and really started doing some work, which again, in, in a, a, you know, and I think moving forward, we will always look at this first of vetting through these calls for art before we, we put them in our lap and say, okay, we'll put these out in the community is asking those questions of who, who did you talk to, to, to begin with? And, and how did these ideas, how did you come up with this idea for the art box? Uh, and then you wanted to include these communities, but you know, do you have buy-in with them? Have you communicated with anybody? So I think that was an important lesson to learn. And um, so again, we went from this uh, particular view to, uh, so we, we kind of scrapped that. Uh, we reached out to these different community partners. Um, as far as the, the community of artists, I mean, we have our general reach to Facebook and through, you know, our, our email blasts and the people that subscribe to the Arts Council. And we have, you know, different groups out there that are doing a lot of the work with a lot of the people that we're trying to reach um, from the Multicultural Center to Lutheran Social Services. Um, we we kind of went through the whole gamut of, of all these different community uh, areas where we know that there's artists that exist that we've never even tapped into. Um, and I think this is where these relationships that we're going to start building on as the Arts Council really are, you know, this is kind of our first steps. Um, so reaching out, you know, via first email and then some phone calls just to communicate with some of these groups and like how we can best work with their uh, situations. And with COVID, it is a little difficult. I mean, a lot of the groups that we were working with said right away, it's hard for us to reach the community that we generally, you know, the guests that we work with or, you know, the clients that we work with because of COVID and we don't have that direct reach. But um, here's some ways that you can do that. So again, we worked with these community partners. Uh, there was a much, much larger list, but with everything that's going, I think some people just got a little busy and we'll keep, we'll keep working at that. And I think that's the point of this is continuing to not just develop these relationships, but, but more down the road um, and just figuring out what they need you know, how does that call for art, you know, actually putting that original call for art in front of them and saying, would this, uh, would the folks that you work with, will they actually, would this be something they'd be interested in? And they were able to kind of give us some really great feedback on what that looked like. You know, here we were asking for a lot of personal information. So from the Bishop Dudley, um, a lot of the folks that are in that community, they don't have a home address. They don't have a, a story maybe they want to share. They don't have certain things. So making that a requirement for the call for art did not, was not inclusive for everybody because they didn't feel like they wanted to maybe share that or they didn't have a home. Um, and so we got conversation with, with Bishop Dudley and like the St. Francis House and the Union Gospel Mission on different ways that we can work with their clients as well as like the stipend was kind of an issue too. The threshold of like $800, bringing that down to 600 so that it wasn't something that if, if somebody, did, and not just for the Bishop Dudley, I think this is across the board, if somebody didn't want to file that on their taxes, and that didn't even come up to come up into my mind, uh, as well as how the the stipend was uh, granted to the folks is through a check. Well, some people don't have a an ID to, to cash a check, so we had to kind of come back and really rethink on how we do these calls for art and and quit you know making it easier for me, I guess, as the administrator, make it easier for everybody else. Uh, looking at it, yes, it might take me a little bit longer to figure these different paths out, but I think it's worth it because we're, you know, we're saying we want to include everybody, but what does that actually look like other than just saying that? And there's so many different layers to that work that that has to happen. Um, so uh, we, kind of moving forward down the list here with Lutheran Social Services, uh, we worked with them on that call for art again. And they said, you know, it sounds like, you know, we, we found out from Multicultural Center, well, you really need to translate this. There's some top languages that are spoken in South Dakota or in Sioux Falls in particular. And 
maybe have this brochure or whatever you end up doing translated in these top six languages. So we, we, we got that feedback. And then Lutheran Social Services said, you know, that's great that you're doing that, but also is there a budget to provide for a cultural interpreter? Uh, because just because you translated it doesn't make the process any more easier to understand. You know, you might need somebody to kind of hold someone's hand through this process. I mean, if this is really what you want is to get these folks from the start to the finish line, uh, with this call for art, we need to help some of that process. So I was able to go back with a lot of this feedback that I received back to the city and say, you know, I mean, here's our traditional call for art. This is how we would generally do things, but we need to change everything. Um, we also reached back out to Bloomberg Philanthropies and sat down with them for a little bit and talked to them about what this looks like and how you really make it more equitable. Before it was, you really had to have a computer and a computer program and you'd have to be able to like get on there and like make make a design and we kind of threw around an idea of creating like a brochure more or less um, and i do want to mention craig was also very generous with his comments and gave us a little feedback too and you said one of the smartest things is you know get rid of the theme and keep it very simple um so through all those comments and i'll show you what it ended up looking like um oh Oh, well, that would have been very helpful in my talking points. I forgot to add these up, you guys. Sorry. Uh, so yes, you can kind of go through. Um, and then one of the last things was bringing, bringing whatever we came up with to the organizations directly. So I'll, I'll go to the next slide. Um, so this is what we came up with. It was a brochure uh, that was a trifold um, on 11 by 7 sheet. 11 by 17 sheet of paper. And it was very simple. I mean, a very simple call for art a small example of what the art box looks like. And then with instructions, if, if they wanted to do a digital submission or get some more information, they could go to the website. I um, mean, I know, you know, just putting this in someone's hands isn't really enough, but what we actually did was we worked again with those organizations with Lutheran Social Services and the Multicultural Center to bring these brochures directly to them and, and work with their teachers and the folks that are, are working with their guests one-on-one -on -one and explain to them how this works. Um, instead of just kind of just, oh, I dropped them off there. You have them, figure it out. Uh, really doing more handholding. Again, I mean, this isn't an easy process and it, it realizing like it shouldn't be easy for me to make this happen. It's gonna be a lot of work. So uh, that was kind of eye-opening for me as well as, you know, just this idea of creating access to people that didn't have access to this before. So uh, we've brought this to the Bishop Dudley and to all these other communities. Uh, you can pick up these at the local libraries right now, any of the Siouxland libraries. And I mean, I, I do have to say, I think we kind of, as I look at this on a broader scale, we really want to bring South Dakota into it. That's a bigger, that's a lot more work. And maybe Craig, we have a lot of work to do <laughs> on something like that, but we didn't want to, we didn't want to constrict it to just Sioux Falls residents um, because we know that there's kind of a broader audience within even the universities and then across across the state and rapid. Um, so this is what it ended up looking like. And again, I've got a little example here. You can see it's very simple. So you can fill it out right onto the, you know, draw your design right onto it or paint. Um, and it can be turned back into that library. And then uh, we're actually still in the middle of the call for art. As you can see, I've got till April 30th. And then right now we've got probably as far as online submissions, I've got about 30 submissions from or 30 artists that have submitted some multiple times. And then uh, after the call for art, I'm, I'll go pick up these brochures at the different locations. And then uh, from the first through the third, that'll happen. And then there'll be another process where we're going to jury it. So reaching back out with uh, those community partner groups and finding uh, folks in those organizations that want to help us with that jury process, because I think, you know, that's another step of it that is, is difficult to understand is, you know, how can we jury these if it's just a, a small group really originally it was supposed to be uh, members of the uh, Sioux Falls Visual Arts Commission, which is great, but they don't really represent uh, uh, the broader audience and the whole community. So making sure that we tap back into those community partnerships and, and continue to develop those. And I have to say, you know, I mean, there is one thing that I think I realized too, is this, it just kind of keeps opening the box and it, it doesn't just stop here. Like this art box project is going to be great when it comes out, but developing those relationships and even sitting down with the Bishop Dudley, they're like, we really appreciate all the work that you've done. We see how far you've come, but 
you know, you give us this beautiful brochure, but here's another thing. We don't have materials to draw on them. Uh, our guests don't have access to those things. So, you know, that's kind of opened another door of we need to look at maybe doing a, a supply drive and in working together with different folks together to get supplies to those uh, groups instead of, you know, and again, this kind of ties it all back. If we, if we were to go back and write this grant, we kind of know the funding where we need to put funding, you know, maybe materials for, for bringing with the brochures to that. I mean, even just printing the brochures, we were lucky enough that the city of Sioux Falls had the machine that actually folded these and was able to print me out 500 uh, brochures and then all the different translated language brochures. Um, but that's a lot. And it was something that would never have crossed my mind. Honestly, the way we had done it in the beginning had was a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper front and back. And that was your call for art and you download it online. I mean, to something that, you know, really thinking about that in the forefront of the funding and how much needs to go into that, to the translations, to the cultural interpreters, to the, the feet on the, on, the, on the ground, working with each one of these organizations, going to their offices and, and sitting down and talking with them when, when they have a minute. Cause honestly, this call for art is important, but there's so many other important work that's going on right now, especially with COVID. It's really hard to, you know, just send an email and, and assume that's going to be enough. Um, and I think, you know, one of the other things that I learned too, it was kind of a, kind of a burn for the, you know, to me to come back and say to the city, like, these are the kind of, we're not, we're not doing this quite right. I felt like there had been a little bit of um, kind of, how do I say this? There, kind of not a super offended, but they were kind of like, well, I didn't, we didn't mean that to be, you know, did not inclusive. And, and I think just saying, but it was, you know, let's just call it what it is. And, 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 and to be open with that and, and to be open for the feedback that people are going to say, this isn't, this isn't helping anybody. You know, if you really wanted to do this, this is, you know, you have to do the work. And I think not being scared of the, having that conversation, because it, I don't think anyone here wants to be doing anything wrong, but I, I think we, we, you know, doing the old, you know, what Craig was saying, the status quo is not enough. And, and it's not, we should not be moving forward in that direction. We really need to make sure we're developing those relationships ahead of time, instead of trying to cram it down, you know, when we get the grant, all of a sudden, you know, and I think that happens a lot is we get the grant and now we have to start developing those relationships. Um, and I think that needs to just maybe stop for sure. <laughs> it definitely does. Um, so anyways, that was kind of my uh, my first experience with uh, equitable call for, for art. And I hope, you know, that other folks can maybe hear this story and learn a little bit, but I, I do encourage you. I mean, this is always going to be developing these relationships and, and being open to this. I don't think that there's one right answer. So this might not be the answer for every call for art. Um, and to just make sure that you're always just open to, you know, learning new things. So that that's it. That's what I got. I know I didn't even take that much time up. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was that was perfect. That was perfect. Um, if you could click quick click on uh, stop sharing for me on your end, Kellen. Perfect. Thanks. Um, great. Well, so a couple of really great questions have been coming in uh, that I'd like to, to to bring forth. But first, I wanted to just kind of say thank you both so much. I mean, this has been um, incredibly illuminating. It's it's such great work that is happening all around the state. Um, and I think that the thing that I'm one of the things that really jumps out at me that I like that <laughs> these two things are going to sound contradictory. But on the one hand, I liked uh, Kellen when you were talking about don't be afraid to put the brakes on, you know, if something isn't working, just pause, step back, rethink, reanalyze how you're doing things. I think so often, um, especially for us in the nonprofit world, you know, we have grant deadlines, we need to use money by certain dates, we have uh, seasons where we think, okay, we always do an exhibit in the fall. Um, and, and of course, there's, there's definitely some positives to that, to, to having those, that seasonality, but don't be afraid to stop and rethink so that you don't just keep going with the status quo. Then the, the other side of that coin um, is, is the opposite in a way, which was um, just iterate and keep going. You know, you said this isn't perfect. 
but we're, we're making progress. We're putting another foot forward and then we're learning from that so that we can make the next step after that. Um, I think both things happen so often with us. Either we get paralyzed with fear that we're not going to do the right thing and we just stop or we just say, well, I don't know how to do it. So we're just going to keep going the old way. So I, I think there's been some really exciting ways to address that. Um, so first, I wanted to ask a couple questions of Dr. Howe uh, that came in from Annie on the, uh, um, uh, in the audience. Um, first was, how were the artists invited for your, um, uh, was there a public call to art? Was it a private invitation? Kind of how did you approach that for these exhibits? Oh. Uh, so <laughs> thanks for the question. Uh, so, yes, this is completely different. It was uh, private calls for art uh, on that Lakota emergence exhibit uh, for multiple reasons. First, we wanted this, we wanted uh, eight women and eight men. So that was going to be uh, no, <laughs> no debate there. So that's going to take some uh, structuring to make sure we end up with those numbers. And then we wanted to have this diversity in in the artworks, in the genres represented. So again, we just can't reply, uh, rely on a open call to produce that. So we want, and this was our first effort and we wanted to just do our best and try to find these artists that are at the top of their games, you know, because uh, we just, it was dependent upon those artworks for the success of the project. You can have all the best ideas you want and if these artists don't produce, then it's gonna fail. Um, so this, the second question from Annie, it kind of really dovetails nicely with that one, which was just how, how did, it may, maybe just because it was the private call, but you know, what was your approach to balance, um, uh, her words are, um, contemporary traditional art with a more individualized, uh, form? So, right. So, uh, uh, those 16 that started, we try to stick with them. I mean, we, and I, it's kind of contradictory in a way that. You know, if they're, I'll ask them almost always. I ask them first if they want to be in these subsequent exhibits because they they went out on a limb with us on that first exhibit. But this last exhibit, you know, we have seventy seven creatives involved, so we are expanding all the time. And I also rely on these artists that are in the exhibit to make recommendations on new artists to be involved. And for instance, John Dwayne Gosen Center has made two recommendations, and both of those. Uh, artists ended up in future exhibits that that are central to our to those artists that are represented. Great. Um, yeah, that 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 approach is really interesting. The sort of trust transfer in a way. I think we often think that. Um, I mean, I make this mistake just like forgetting to introduce people to my wife because I assume that everyone I know knows everybody I know and and in a way it's like that especially in South Dakota we're not too far removed from each other but oftentimes I find like oh yeah the, you know this person that we do work with all the time um, isn't uh, isn't uh, um, 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 aware of this other person we do all this work with why don't we help get them collaborating working together um, and then like you were saying with the artists if you can ask of your artists hey who else should we be involved um, and I think Kellen, in, in a way that's analogous to the way that the um, community outreach you were working on with the call for art. So you're you're reaching out to these organizations, but then saying, hey, who else? Who, who are we missing? You know, who do you know that we really need to be talking to because we don't know everybody? And, and that's the point is we're trying to reach out to a community, uh, multiple communities that are often not uh, reached out to and we don't know enough about. Um, so getting that kind of boots on the ground um, um, first person perspective is really key. Um, another question just came in for Kellen. Um, do you have an ideal for how many cultures would be represented in the final, uh, the final work um, uh, for the wraps? And um, have you been uh, open to, uh, let's see here, Oh, have, have uh, organizations been open to granting you the increase in time needed to have this more equitable approach? Um, so, you know, I think that's a big problem in the nonprofit world is um, granting organizations understanding that there's an administrative aspect to <laughs> making these projects work. Um, so um, I'm curious what happens there for you. 
Yeah, so I'm not sure what the number would look like as far as the different cultures that are represented. I mean, I've, with having the digital, uh, maybe getting more digital submissions in right now and not picking up those paper submissions till later, I guess there's, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I wish I had a, an indication on that. I think there's over 180 spoken languages in Sioux Falls. Is that correct? Or, I mean, there's there's just a lot, there's a lot of different cultures that are kind of in the, in the melting pot that is Sioux Falls, but we're also reaching out across the state as much as possible um, from what we've done for our call for art. So I guess there's just, I mean, there's no telling until we, we start getting those uh, artworks back. Um, and, and also, I mean, there's not, there's not a line. What culture are you coming from for me to, to, to really identify that? So I, I think that's kind of an, an open question, but we're, we're hoping it will, uh, you know, very many people will be represented at least. Uh, and as far as the organizations that we're working with, you know, just getting the time to sit down with somebody from the Bishop Dudley was very difficult to find an actual time. Uh, they, since COVID, they had had uh, a lot of their staff had not been coming in. They don't have as many volunteers. And, uh, you know, the caseworker was just loaded up. I mean, the 20 minutes that I got of her time was really sacred time for her. Um, but she was really open. She was also surrounded by artwork that the guests had created for her. Uh, she said, you know, this is their currency is art. And then one of the gentlemen that had created many of the pieces had actually walked in uh, while we were talking and she introduced me to him. and. And he was really excited about the opportunity. So, you know, I think see, her seeing that was was kind of like, okay, this is something we can invest a little bit of time in. Uh, but also having that conversation with not just you do something for us, but hey, further down the road, let's try to work with you and some of these other uh, groups and maybe do a giant, you know, uh, not a giant, but a big uh, supply drive and how we can get art supplies into your guests' hands instead of just walking out the door and saying, well, then use colored pencils. Like, I don't know what you're gonna use, you know. Uh, so, I mean, and with the, like Lutheran social services, they actually have a, a staff meeting once a month that I sat in on, uh, and was able to kind of talk about the call for art and, and have questions. So it's difficult again with COVID and what's happening, because I think nonprofits are really suffering with their staffing, but everyone at this point has been very gracious with their time. And I don't, I don't know how much time we're getting out of it, but I feel like they're, they're at least addressing it and, and getting it out there as much as possible. Great. Well, um, we're, we're unfortunately coming up to the end of our hour together, um, which uh, um, is really disappointing because I think we could sit here for another hour and, and chat. It's just always so great to have both of you on and to get the opportunity to um, be together, even if it's virtually in our little square boxes. But um, really want to thank you both so much. Um, I think that there's so many great takeaways from today. Um, you know, I really liked the idea, Kellen, too, that you said that this shouldn't be easy. You know, I think that this is this is hard hard work and um, it's hard for everybody, but that doesn't mean we should shy away from it, but that we should lean into that. Um, and also just uh, the other one I really want to point out that I so appreciate, Craig, is is paying an honorarium to everybody involved in the process. You know, even the 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 sort of the small pieces for Dockaway, there's some uh, value that is literally placed on all of that work because so often I think we can um, we can take advantage of, of, of our artists and our creatives um, uh, unintentionally often, but but very real. Um, I think that there's another uh, great one. Uh, Dale Lamphere recently did a project with Monument Health that I think is being uh, displayed shortly, but they paid every um, everyone that submitted a proposal in the call for art. They even paid for their time. Um, so I really appreciate that, that that culture is starting to transform just a little bit in this state, kind of bit by bit. Um, and I think that would be the last kind of observation I might have is just um, some, I know I, I feel this way a lot, that sometimes it feels like, okay, I'm not, um, is this work making enough of a difference? Is this small step making a difference? But I think oftentimes um, it really looks like these small steps that we're making start to, um, um, it's almost like the snowball rolling downhill. It seems like they change begets change begets change. And the more we can work on it, instead of saying, oh, that's not a big deal. Let's not even worry about it for this round. Just make those small changes, make some progress and move forward uh, to keep things changing in our state and progressing. So um, 
Thank you all again for joining us today. Uh, we'll be sending out the recording of this session. Uh, we'll also uh, have um, some follow-up links and some information on, on both of the speakers and the projects today. Uh, any parting words, either Kellen or Craig? Uh, thank you again so much for, for being here with us. Great. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Wishing you all a, a wonderful Thursday and a great rest of the week.